Greetings, greetings, all my dreamers and dreamettes. It's your boy Mickey Fenty, aka Mickey Made It. If you're new to this channel, you know what to do with this channel. Subscribe right now. And if you want to support the brand, it's inspired by dreams. Shop. Okay, today's episode, this is a very touchy subject, but I felt like we have to have these conversations just to heal and overall have some kind of understanding and making this world a better place. So, okay, today's episode. I edited a few videos together of different people from all walks of life speaking on how their parents are prejudiced. That is a lot to touch and a lot to unpack in these situations. So I want you guys to have some understanding and try to look through their lens to see how their upbringing shapes the person they are and the understanding that they have in 2024, the times we're living now. It's all about this. Let's get it. There are so many white mothers who sit there and they have mixed babies and then they literally destroy us. My mom, ever since I was little, has been calling black women disgusting and loud and dirty and arrogant and ghetto. And for some reason, she fails to realize that I am the same woman she is talking about she fails to realize that there's no difference between us the only difference is the slightly lighter complexion that's it y'all sit here as white women and you have black and brown and asian children and then you literally talk about us like we can't hear you you talk about how we're disgusting and how we leech off the government and how we're not even from America and how we don't even need to have protests for things because everyone's created equal in the first place but then you date white supremacists and bring them into our own fucking houses and you expect us to be comfortable you expect us to be comfortable with your husbands that wear trump hats you expect us to be happy and accepting that you want to go out for shots of tequila and make fun of every man in the room and say i bet his name is juan i don't find that funny i don't find the joke in that to make fun of everybody's fucking race except your kid because you, for some reason, have the capacity to think that they're different, to think that they are you when they have never been a part of you in the fucking first place. I don't get it. I don't get how y'all can pretend that your kids don't hear you and then be absolutely baffled when they finally do and they finally don't want to be around you. So for the kids that have grown up in environments in the exact same that I have, I don't care if you're afraid of not having parents. I'm afraid of having a parent that can't even see who I am when I'm looking them right in the face. And the fact that I don't even have a parent that knows who I am, it's pretty much like having none anyways. I realized that my parents were racist until after I moved out of their house. When you're around it all the time, it can be easy to miss. Every once in a while, I remember things that were just normal to me growing up and found out that, whoo, that was real racist. Now remember, you can be racist to any person of color, not just black people. You can't be racist against white people. You can be prejudiced but you can't be racist. Racism is literally based on white people being the bestest. Ugh. Now I'm not gonna repeat anything that they said because some of it's truly vile, honestly. I wanted to give a little unsolicited advice though. Process the words of the people around you as if they were politicians. Critically analyze what you're hearing. So story time. When I was in kindergarten, I used to hang out my white racist grandfather. I know, I know, it sounds crazy, right? That 
me, melanated, would hang out with my white racist grandfather. But at the time, I was still cute. I had like curly hair. My hair is still curly, but right now it's like flat ironed and well blow dried and flat ironed. But I had curly hair. I had these light eyes and my skin was still less melanated than what it is right now. And so, you know, I guess he felt a little bit more comfortable with hanging out with his granddaughter who looked more ambiguous than what I look right now. But uh, we would go to the racetrack in El Cajon or somewhere in San Diego near El Cajon. And at the time, I really wanted to be like him. And he used to chew like tobacco. So he'd have that, you know, Mm, and the spit thing going on and I wanted to be like him so he would give me a little bit of tobacco yes at five years old and I'd pack it in there and I'd and the cars would go around the track and I had such a great time with my racist white grandfather but as I got older, my melanin started to darken up a little bit and my hair got a little bit thicker. And uh, he then moved to Florida, to Live Oak, Florida, which is considered the South, not like Miami or Orlando or the Keys, but Live Oak. And uh, he went back to his racist ways and denied having black people in his family. That's one of the things that I don't enjoy about being biracial. But typically it's okay. Typically I'm good. I'm 51 years old and I feel that people who are Gen X and biracial like have really subscribe. paved the way for those who've come behind us. And so, uh, I don't know. It's cool. It's been hard. It's been really hard. Having family reject you simply because of melanin. I really don't understand how people can be racist, how people can dislike you because the sun loves you. Jealous, maybe? My dads were actually verbally assaulted many, many times by black women assuming their legitimacy as parents were unfit because of the difference in skin tone. In one particular circumstance, one of my dads took me to the beauty supply store because I needed more braiding hair. Since my hair was halfway done, they put a bandana over my hair so that I just don't look like some crazy black kid that's just running around. A black woman then came up to my dad in the parking lot and told him that he's racist for having a bandana in my hair. And little did she know that my dads were getting more braiding hair so that they could continue braiding my hair. They've been doing my hair ever since I was a baby in many different forms, whether it was figuring out how to use a curling iron or legitimately braiding my hair in box braids. Being raised by a white mother um, left me very ignorant, but also anti-black for many years of my life. And that's not something like I say with pride at all. I say it with a lot of shame. Now, I know that because of how I was raised, like, and because my dad didn't do his job as a um, black man, like being ra uh, married to a white woman, that I guess it wasn't like my fault as a kid, but the more like work that I'm doing and the more, I don't know, I, I stepped away from like my mother, the more that I, I'm just sad because I see all these ways that I was just being me. Like I was just being the black biracial daughter that she had, but she made me shrink myself and made me fit into the spaces she wanted me to fit into so that she was comfortable and so that I made everybody else comfortable. And one of those things was like not wearing a bonnet like outside of the house or anything like that like i remember we would like you know go to the stores and stuff and if she would see um especially a black woman like with her bonnet on like she would say like such awful things things that i'm not going to repeat 
And I remember as a kid never understanding, like, what's the problem with that? Like, what is the problem? But the more that her hate and ignorance was said to me, the more that when I would go out and I would see, like, a black woman or a person of color with a bonnet on, I would think, like, why are you coming out of the house like that? Like, that's not appropriate. <sighs> the more that I wear and protect my hair in and outside of the home, the more my curls stay good and like stay, stay healthy, not good, stay healthy. And that there's no shame, there's no shame. And there's nobody coming up to me saying anything. There's nobody looking at me funny. It was just my mom's own internal hatred for women of color and the fact that she felt so confident to and proud to say those things around her biracial daughters that influenced my brain to think that it was an issue when it, it wasn't an issue and I always knew it was an issue but when your mother that raises you continues to be so toxic I guess your brain starts to change but it like makes me so sad because I spent so many years not protecting my hair outside of the home because of what my mother said and allowed myself to internalize that instead of just being proud of who I was and learning from other women of color on how to protect my hair. When you're mixed and have black girl hair but you're Hispanic family don't play about cascarones. When did you find out that your family was racist? So growing up, my mom often spoke about how she would challenge her parents' racist beliefs. Um, and so I knew my grandparents were racist, but my grandpa's super soft-spoken, so I never really heard anything like that from him. But the first instance of me experiencing it was when I had helped my cousin get ready for a band camp parade thing. And while we're standing there, her mom, my aunt, is pointing out people. She gets to this guy, and she says, well, he wanted to date her, but we didn't let her. Um, we said no. And I go, why? He looks like a perfectly nice guy. And she goes, we don't support interracial marriage. That's when I knew. So today at work, one of my coworkers was telling me how hard it was growing up as a mixed girl with a white mom. And I was explaining to her something that I'm really surprised she didn't know. She was... I was telling her that historically white women have always been jealous of black women because the slave owner that was the man would come out and sleep with the slave and then get her pregnant and then when it was time for the baby to be born, the white woman would make sure that the slave mother and the daughter were sold, it didn't matter if they were separating a family, it didn't matter if they were sold together, it didn't matter if they were sold separately, she just didn't want any more signs of his infidelity. And that was the reason why they were always jealous of us. It never stopped. It is what it is. So y'all, you two were born in Southern Georgia and spent most of your, well, you, well, Gloria, your whole adult life. No, we about to hear some mm, 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 mm. life and mom until you were what, 50, 40 something. You moved down to New Mexico. Yeah, I lived in Brunswick and Jacksonville and folks, you know, all my people was there. So your growing up days, um. You didn't move, uh, move away from the South until you were uh, way into an adulthood. Um, so both of y'all know that one of the big talk topics in the country right now is what's going on race-wise. You know, um, there's a whole lot of stuff regarding race uh, that people are talking about today. But I recognize y'all were born in the early and middle 1940s. And when you came became teenagers in the 1950s, uh, segregation was going on in the South and uh, race as, it racism. Coming to an end then. Okay, and but racism what it, was at its all yeah. time high yeah. when y'all, uh, well, other than slavery. But I want to get your memories of what you remember at that time, what it was like being a teenager, how that made y'all feel, and what you witnessed during uh, these times. You want to go first? Oh, yes. Um, we didn't. I, we was always strictly whites in our school. And when I was coming up, you know, everybody was white. Everybody was white. And, uh, and then when um, 
they started integrating, you know. It still did not, it didn't bother me. I, I didn't like some of the things that the Ku Klux Klan done. I did not like that at all. Even as a child, I knew that's not right. To treat the, the black people like that. We yeah. had a mother. Yeah, a Christian mother, mother a Christian that kept mother. us straight. That yeah. God loved them just yeah. like He loved us, that's and right. that's where we, uh, where my father was racist, very racist. Yes, and, uh, my, yeah, he was. I didn't know my grandmother was until I talked on the porch we had one day, but uh, the home. Are you through? Yeah. Tell me speak. about what you. <laughs> go ahead. Go sorry. ahead. Tell me about what you saw your grandmother do. We were sitting on the front porch and uh, on Jacksonville Park. We had big white rocking chairs on this old old uh, mansion it used to be at one time, and they fixed it up. And uh, it was a beautiful home. And we were sitting on the front porch, and this elderly black lady came walking by with her hair tied up and taking her groceries home, and just walking along. And Grandma said, "Look at there. She thinks she's just as good as anybody." And I never heard her say anything like that. And uh, I said, well, Grandma, she is. She's not hurting nobody. I said, she's just taking her groceries home. Well, at the time, uh, the Black Panthers was fighting for civil rights and stuff, and it was all over the TVs. And she says, well, you just wait. One day they're going to be marrying and marry white and black and everything. Then you'll see. You'll see. Oh, she was right. That's exactly what happened. But I'd never heard Grandma talk that way, talk down, because she wasn't doing anything, just going home. But uh, if it wasn't for a black woman, my mom, dad, daddy couldn't have made it. Grandma could not feed daddy, but there was a, a black woman that worked for mm -hmm. them that was feeding her baby, so she fed daddy, because grandma's milk had dried up. She, he was fed and kept alive by a black woman. And uh, this is something they didn't like to talk about too much, but I know mm -hmm. because I heard it. And uh, they like they used her like a cow, is what they did. Instead of, I don't know if they ever thanked her for what she did for Daddy, but Grandma had seven children, and Daddy was the baby. And uh, she was in her 40s. She was, he was a change of life baby, they called him. And uh, she got childbirth fever or something. She got sick. Anyway, she had no milk for daddy, but that black wet nurse fed my father. Mm -hmm. And you would think that there would be some kind of a thankfulness there. I never heard that. I didn't hear that out of them. As a matter of fact, they didn't care to talk about it, but uh, she kept daddy alive with her milk. Tell me what it was like going out to dinner, going to the movies. Um, you, you take the okay. theater where we where we lived in Buxton, Georgia. They had a theater. And his name, I remember his name and everything. He was a very nice man. The the blacks had to sit up in the in the top, and the whites sit in the bottom. And it never bothered me or anything. Didn't think about the it. The only thing is one. It was night. just so common. Y'all y'all really just didn't think anything. No, because they, they 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 you know they didn't come down. And uh, they got what they wanted and go up and, you know, and they had their own bathrooms and stuff. And uh, it was just when uh, the Ku Klux Klan came in one night. It was one of the Saturday night. At the movie night. theater? No. No, no, no. Oh, no. Just, they didn't go in. See, she they, said, she's talking about something I don't know nothing about. Okay. They was all dressed in the hoods and stuff. And I never saw they that. said something about they didn't want they didn't want him to ever said they said stare anything. Let the blacks start sitting down and, and the, the movie um, theater owner was going to do that. And well, they had heard something about that anyway. And all the Ku Klux Klan. Anyway, uh, Irm I think then went shot to the movie to the uh, roller rink that night and. Uh, so I wanted to go see, uh, the, I hadn't seen the movie. They, they had a movie changed every two weeks or something like that. So, and uh, Mama said, well, I really should know that she not go up there tonight if there's going to be any trouble. And Daddy said, oh, there won't be no trouble. He said, I'll be up there with her. And uh, we got there, there was Ku Klux Klan's everywhere. And uh, he said, 
He said, I'll make sure she, she ain't going to get hurt or nothing. Anyway, people come in and they start hollering at him or something. Anyway, please come up there and make him leave. And we went in and watched, watched the movie and everything. Come back out, couldn't see nothing nowhere. Couldn't see nothing nowhere. But right after that, they did integrate. And as far as I know, I've never heard of any problems after that. But it, I think he kind of woke the people work. See the, see in a small town, and you knew you knew some of these men with these hoods on, mm -hmm. and uh, it kind of just faded right on out, you know. But there was I don't know of any of them ever getting hurt or beat or anything. What were their like? Do you remember ever seeing what their bathrooms were like? Their drinking fountains? Oh yeah, All right now. I, I never went been, upstairs. I never went upstairs. No, uh, but this is in Cresses. I was in Cresses with Mama, and I know you were probably somewhere just looking around. But uh, I, this little black boy went up to the fountain, and he was real small. And they had the black, and well, they had one over to the side, the white only. And uh, he could not reach. He knew to go to the black one, you know. And uh, this woman that worked there, he went and pulled on her and said, Ma'am, could you help me get some water? And she said, she looked down at him like he was the scum of the earth and said, go get your black mammy to help you. And this is just a little boy. A little boy. Just a thirsty little boy. And the look boy. on his face was devastating. I remember that. And the bathrooms, the black bathroom and the white bathroom, you couldn't hardly stand to go past it. They, nobody cleaned the black bathroom. But the white bathroom always smelled better. You know, I mean, it was like clean. And uh, there's so many things. I saw how they were treated. Like she was talking about come in where we were. They stood on a line outside the window. And when everybody was going out, she'd raise that window and they'd hand her their money and tell them what they And she'd act like it was dirty. Just like that. I remember, I remember how she looked. I was a teenager when all this was going on. And uh, they get there, it didn't matter if it rained, cold or anything, they stood out there to get their stuff. And uh, then they'd go back upstairs with it. But, uh, oh, racism, racism was running rampant. Do you feel like how they're saying it is today compares to how it was then? It's better today. They got, we don't have all that kind of stuff. I mean, oh, everything's I over here. I, I, chair, I differ. I mean, they have fought for their rights. Yeah. They have uh, been the anger in the people. I understand anger because they had been so mistreated for so long. Mm -hmm. They're they're being stopped by cops for no reason. Things like that. Okay. Well, thank you for the history. One thing I could say is, understanding your past is a blueprint to fixing your future. Let me know down in the comments what you guys think about it, about these conversations that need to be had. And does it give people a different understanding? Or some people, have you been through this? Or are you going through this with your family? Until next time, it's your boy Mickey Fenty, aka Mickey Made It. If you're new to this channel, you know what to do to this channel. 